Before, before we begin with the last lecture, I do have something that I should have said at the beginning after lunch, and I apologize. Um, I forgot to communicate for the afternoon visitors that we are saving our questions for the end of each three lecture period. So um, after this last lecture, all three of our afternoon lecturers will be up on stage and we have several hand mics and what you can do is raise your hand and ask them questions as we did after lunch. And that was a very lively um, and exciting exchange. So I look forward to it. When I was putting together the order of the program, I decided to have Dr. Michael Thomas read last for a couple of reasons. One was that as one of the two directors of the Atlantis Project, I thought it made a nice framing because we started with Dr. Clark first thing this morning. So it's a neat finish to our day's proceedings. And then I also thought that on a late Friday, discussion of wine was just a really nice idea, <laughs> even if you don't imbibe. So with that, I have the, the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Michael Thomas, who is the director for the Center of the Study for the Study of Ancient Italy out of the University of Texas at Austin, or CSI, and co-director of the Aplantis Project. His talk has the title, A Tale of Two Villas, Luxury, Wine, and Water, and the Last Years of Aplantis. Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Dia. All right, am I on? Everyone hear me? Um, I know everyone's probably tired of hearing everyone thank everyone, but I'm going to have to do it myself because it. Uh, thank you, especially to Regina, obviously to all of my Aplantis, uh, uh, Aplantis project colleagues, and uh, Elaine, of course, for all, everything, all the work that's gone into this. And then to you, uh, to the students, to the faculty here who have taken this exhibit and really done some, and, and just our side of the plant has really done some exciting things with it. So you should feel good about what you've done here uh, as well. And it's, 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 uh, it's pretty exciting for us. Um, OK, so I appreciate Regina letting me go last. The only trouble is when you go last, your colleagues sometimes steal your thunder. So you, uh, you may hear some things that you've already heard. But in a way, I think this lecture will provide sort of a synthesis of, of many of the things that we've already heard today. Uh, and, and really, what I'm talking about here is, when I talk about the last years of Aplantis, is, is that, and when I say the last years, we're not talking about the last two or three years, but probably about the last 40 years or so. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it, it's a moment at both sides of sort of intense uh, uh, activity uh, and also apparently some, uh, some uh, two different directions really for the sites. So that's sort of, that's sort of what we're going to talk about. Okay, so uh, Aplantis as we know it. Uh, we've, we use this term, I don't think anyone's ever pointed this out uh, today, but we use this term a lot, and, and the reason that we call our site Aplantis is because uh, it showed up. Uh, it shows up on the uh, on the Tabula Poitingeriana, which is uh, a fourth century A.D. of a second century A.D. Roman map. So it's a map that's probably made a hundred years or so after the eruption, uh, and you very conveniently get this big building, and it's always tempting for us to think that one of our big buildings is indeed that big building, uh, but who knows. But it is located, uh, it's, its proximity to, um, to Pompeii and Herculaneum uh, is suggestive that we are indeed uh, excavating uh, at Aplantis, and that site occupies uh, what we now uh, know as the modern day uh, thriving metropolis of Torre Annunziata, uh, a place near and dear to our hearts. Um, and again, this has been pointed out, I've, we've seen lots of satellite views of Vesuvius, uh, but it's important here, and this will come back up, but it's important uh, uh, in this discussion and really in the understanding of this site. And again, thanks so much to, to jo Giovanni De Maio for all the work that he's done. But the proximity of both of these sites to the ocean really plays into the way they were experienced and, uh, and the way that they function. So uh, that's, uh, we really can't, uh, we can't really emphasize that enough. So Aplantis A 
and uh, a Plantis B. Uh, again, we've seen, you guys know where they are, they're 300 meters apart. Uh, they are about uh, nine to 10 meters different in elevation. Uh, so if you walk from one to the other, you walk from a Plantis A is about nine to 10 meters higher. The, the, so the, our 79 AD floor level, as it were, is about nine to 10 meters higher uh, than, uh, than Villa B. And again, this makes sense with what we've heard because we know that uh, a Plantis A was, uh, enjoyed that really nice uh, spot up on a cliff and, and, a, and uh, a Plantis B was down uh, closer to the water. Now we've talked about the excavation history uh, and both villas, it's interesting too because uh, both villas were excavated at the same, uh, at, I mean not at the exact same time, but excavation was going on at both places at, uh, at the same time. So we know uh, from several talks that uh, we start, that excavation started in the 60s uh, in uh, at Villa A. And then in a, not, about 1974, uh, uh, the school just down the street that we still walk by uh, every day, uh, start, decided to add a gymnasium. And they were sinking piers uh, for this gymnasium. And as they were driving cores down, all sorts of goodies were coming up. And they, they stopped. And they said, all right, we're going to excavate. And they began the excavation uh, now with what we've all uh, we've all been hearing about uh, uh, Villa B. Now, what we did uh, as, and what's interesting is, and, and we, we've, we used to say this a lot, we don't say it as much, but those two, one of the reasons that we started all of this is that those two uh, sites, pretty much after excavation finished for both in the 80s, more or less, they, they, they sort of fell, uh, they sort of kind of, drifted along without a lot of fanfare. Villa, uh, Villa A was really first published by John in many ways. Little articles here and there. John wrote some articles and, and, and devoted a chapter to it in his book. But other than that, no large scale uh, study had been done. And Villa B was really not open to the public. No, very few scholars could even get into it. So it was also sort of hidden uh, from the world. Again, some some, some exhibition catalogs here and there, uh, some stuff on jewelry, uh, some stuff on, on, you know, it would show up, but no systematic study. So really when we got here, uh, our, uh, you know, the idea was that we were gonna take, take what we were given and, and really come up with a comprehensive study. And it started off with John uh, and myself and uh, our architect, Jess Galloway, really the three of us were the first, you know, the first season we sort of strolled in like, all right, what are we gonna do? And then we started looking around and realized, oh my God, there's so much stuff here, you know, and it grew to the 42 uh, scholars alone who have done research on, uh, on Villa A, and it's many of whom continue to work with us uh, now. So let's go to the Villa. The Villa A, we've all heard about it. Uh, is, uh, and, and again, too, with that, that proximity, uh, that it's, we're, we're almost at that sort of, almost due, exactly due south of, of Vesuvius. Here we are looking out uh, from the apartment building back uh, up with Villa A in the foreground to the right, Vesuvius uh, in the background. And the, as we've heard already, and I, I was fortunate enough to steal, uh, steal Tim's slide here, uh, the position of this villa was was really its you know is one of its defining care if not its defining characteristic. Obviously, the architecture is spectacular, but that architecture is built and and the design of that architecture throughout the history of the villa is built to take advantage of the views that it had both uh, both out you know the beautiful views of the Bay of Naples, obviously to the mountains uh, to the uh, to the mountains to the east uh, that are that form the peninsula, the, the Sorrentine Peninsula, and even to the beautiful gardens uh, to the south. So the sighting of this and and those views up to the south would it would have sort of you know looked out to those roll the, to those gardens and sort of as the hill sort of rolls up uh, toward Vesuvius. So there wasn't a bad view in the place, and and the the architecture was designed. Uh, to take uh, advantage of that. And the villa, 
as a whole uh, is, is really has uh, a lot of emphasis, it seems, on not only on those views, but also on entertaining. Uh, and even from the earliest phase, you heard about some of the phasings uh, in, in Eva's talk. And I'm, gonna, I'm going right here. You can see that little uh, shade of blue. You might be able to see, can you guys see? Uh, right here. Uh, that, uh, that is a, sort of a, from the early history of the villa, it's, it's an entertainment area that's a kitchen, a, uh, a dining room or triclinium, uh, and some support rooms. And that's our famous room 14, which is reconstructed uh, in, the mu in the museum exhibit here. Um, and it is a triclinium. Uh, we know it's a triclinium. It has the, the great, it's got the little carpet mosaic here. And, and I'm just talking about this briefly because it, uh, just to give you a sense of, again, what the experience of these places would have been like. And that triclinium, uh, and now we're sitting in the spot that Romans called the locus consularis, which is essentially the place, the, the, the place of honor. So if you were invited, if you were a senator and you were invited by the owner of this villa, you would be, you would, if you were the big guest of the evening, you would be given this spot. And, and the idea was this spot afforded the best view out. Uh, and it's a great view here. It's a little harder to see because we're looking at a wall uh, in the background. But you had the great painting, the, the painted architecture that actually lines up with the colonnade out there. And if you can sort of use your imagination, you get the sense that you would have looked eventually out, probably through some columns framing that, but out toward uh, the Bay of Naples. And so again, this this was part of the experience. Yes, the painting was great. Yes, the design was amazing in these tall rooms and, and, and lavishly decorated spaces, but they were, they still always, uh, you were always reminded of where you were uh, by the attention to views. Now, another part of this, of the entertainment uh, kind of qualities of this villa was the fact that it um, that it had a large area for uh, its supporting cast. Uh, and that is the slave parasol, which, I've, which we call the slave parasol, which I, 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 you see here highlighted in blue. It's room 32. And, and room 32 is also near and dear to our heart because it's actually where our offices are, 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 are located. So we've spent much of our, our, our life at Aplantis has more or less been one of a slave in many ways other than the fact that where we are. But uh, it's, it's, it's been something that we've, we, a place where we spent uh, a lot of time. John has been, has been slave to many tiny pieces of rubble that you saw uh, piled up, which I, I would say we're all happy this year are officially uh, gone. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, this, the real value of this space is that it provided, it was sort of the nerve center of a villa because uh, if you think about a villa this size, and, and that's the other thing about this villa, it is massive. Uh, right now, we're probably looking at a, a, the excavated area about 30,000 square feet, uh, upwards of 50, maybe 60,000 square feet uh, if we were able to uncover the, the entire villa. So, a ma I mean, I, there's not a lot of 50,000 square foot houses. Uh, well, there aren't Dallas, maybe, but they're not, they're not, I mean, most, we don't see a lot of those, those kind of houses. So, so that's, that's also part of the experience. And what's key is that the slave area uh, would, 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 was so big. So you probably had at least, I mean, hundreds of slaves that were at times working at this villa. And the location of this, uh, of this slave area is very important to one of the later additions, uh, and that is the East Wing. You've heard us talk a lot about the East Wing, uh, which is the area, uh, do you guys see my pointer there? It's the area that, is it showing up or not? No, okay. Um, well, it's the area there uh, to, uh, to the left of the, sw the swimming pool is pretty easy to pick out, to the left of the swimming pool. And uh, it was constructed, and, and we know this actually, I, I thought Evo would point out he didn't. Uh, one of the key moments of our excavation was the ability to date the construction of this. And we feel pretty certain uh, that this is uh, dates to uh, sometime after 45, but probably, I, I would say, the more accurate uh, uh, estimation is around 55. So about 55 AD, so this is about 100 years after the original construction of the villa, the owners decide to add this great 
eastern wing. And this wing uh, was actually, uh, was actually uh, uh, almost exclusively an entertainment area. And that's what we're going we're gonna to look at now uh, uh, briefly. Now, uh, I, I have to disagree with my, uh, my colleague, Eva Venter, because I think the pool was there before the East Wing, but I'm not going to bicker with him uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, but I, I will tell you that the pool played a part in the experience of uh, the swing. And again, it's this idea of these views, uh, that, that rooms are constructed around views. And the rooms here uh, that I just highlighted uh, in, in pink uh, all, there's three big entertainment rooms. The middle one is 69, uh, I can I always get the mix up, 74 on the top, 65 at the bottom. And they all look out onto, uh, onto that yellow parasol, which is 60, uh, which is a very uh, a long parasol that runs the entire length of the pool. And they all look out from there through that, sorry, that's a portico, not a parasol, through that portico, over the pool, to the sculpture and trees on the other side of that, and then to the mountains uh, of uh, that sort of spine of mountains uh, that create uh, the Sorrentine Peninsula. So uh, again, views uh, were part of, of the package here. Now, these were big entertainment rooms, probably what we would call an ecus, uh, uh, and, and they could serve many functions, but it seemed that they were probably uh, set up for, for large entertaining. And they had support rooms. These are these, these little hidden rooms behind that are highlighted in green are places where slaves could have tables set up, probably with pitchers of wine and food, and could easily attend those uh, those, uh, those larger rooms from behind. And if you actually, again, I, I don't have a pointer where I can show you, but if you follow those out, you can see that there's that little, if you, if you sort of go down to the to the south there and, and head toward, uh, toward your left, you will see that, uh, that, the, uh, that they were connected uh, of, through little corridors to the slave peristyle. So this is where food could be brought in. And in fact, the large, uh, my feeling is, and everyone always wants to know what the big hall with the benches is, and I'm sorry I don't have a photograph, but Tim showed it earlier, but it's the one there uh, just south of the uh, 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 just south of the east wing uh, with all of these benches. My theory is, is that those benches were there for the slaves of, of the party goers. So when a big party would come, no one, everyone would always come with slaves, but your slaves wouldn't be part of the service. They would have to go, they, they would go somewhere. And my guess is, is that, 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 uh, that, that hallway provided a place for them to sit and wait and if for some reason they're their owner needed them, they could easily attend to them. All right, so we have these entertainment rooms. We have, we have the support rooms here in green. And then we, they are, and John mentioned these, uh, they are connected by these uh, uh, viridaria, these garden rooms that were, were, were rooms that were open to the sky. They had planters in the middle and then painting, uh, painting, around, uh, you know, painting around the edge uh, on all four walls. And this really created the whole experience there. And I, I apologize to the many uh, plant, planting people who have heard this you know, ad nauseum. Uh, and then uh, at the bottom, we have room 78, also mentioned by uh, John and Tim, which is uh, a room that it's a dieta, uh, probably a sun room. But again, an entertainment room on a more intimate scale, but still very impressive. And John and had talked to you about the expense of the decorations here, uh, the marble, the opus sectile, or cut marble floors, uh, the marble wainscoting, and the exotic marbles that came into play here, and then the wooden paneling, which is uh, the evidence for which is 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 quite uh, astounding and quite rare. But if we if we so we know this this was a room that perhaps that you could. Uh, there's, there's a place for one couch for sure there in that niche, but it could easily accommodate a small uh, dinner party or lunch party or, or gathering of some, uh, or of some type. Uh, and, and it enjoyed these great views out uh, through this big kind of pair of picture windows out, uh, toward, uh, out toward the pool and to the, the sculpture and the fountains uh, that were part of that experience. And in the, same, in the same way, 
we get great views uh, from room 69. And the blue arrow indicates uh, 69 here. And 69 was the room. It was the big room uh, in, in, this, uh, in the design of this wing. Uh, and we even know it was important because uh, they built uh, a, a thing called a, fest what Romans called a fastigium on top of it. And a fastigium was literally a, a, like a temple-like raised roof. So it had a higher roof. The colonnade, as you can see here, was split uh, further apart. Uh, so the, the inner columniation was wider so that uh, it, we would afford a better view uh, out, uh, toward the, uh, out toward the gardens. But even if you're looking at it from the other side of the pool, it's marked as the important room because it has uh, this fastigium on top. And we've, we've talked about its decorations. Uh, it had the big picture window out uh, to the west looking out into the gardens. It had... Uh, it had the uh, it it had the opus sectile floors. Uh, again, you can see them uh, here uh, in the reconstruction. So uh, again, and I, I'm going to some of this has already been talked about, but the part of the experience here was looking from room to room. Uh, and I'll run John's already run this once, but I'll 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 run this this. Uh, this little movie here. So here we're going into, right now we're going into 69 uh, through, this is what we call an enfilade, these aligned doors. Now we're, we're into 74. We're looking at the far garden room and we're about to do our Superman kind of backwards lobster fly here. And we fly backwards. 74, garden room, back into 69, garden room. Now we're back into 65. So you see this progression. And so you're looking from room to room to room. So if you imagine a big party, everyone can sort of, if, if, if the parties are taking over multiple rooms, you can hear guests in the other room, but maybe not, maybe catch a glimpse of them. Uh, but there could be some sort of uh, some some sort of division, and you would think that the important people would be put uh, in 69 because we even know that 69 had the better view uh, from the work of Willemina Yashimsky because we see that the just the trees in front of 69 were shorter. They were. Um, there were big plane trees on either side, but in the middle of there uh, were possibly uh, oleanders uh, and maybe a couple of fruit trees. So these were low, smaller trees affording uh, a better view out beyond uh, the gardens. So again, what's amazing about this is, and especially if you look at, and this really is, when we talk about leisure and, and luxury in the age of Nero, this is, this is one of the most sort of Neronian things. The design of this wing uh, is very much, uh, it's either a slight predecessor, probably a slight predecessor to the type of much more intricate design that's gonna happen in Nero's Domus Aria. But it, it is a very sophisticated, and, and, and Tim, our, our architect, pointed this out, that it's a very sophisticated use of space with the division, the setup for entertainment, uh, the lavish decorations that John has already talked about, uh, the places for slaves to, to be able to, 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 uh, to, uh, to engage uh, uh, the diners and, and, and party goers, places for slaves to wait uh, to help, and then these great views to gardens, to mountains. So a very sophisticated and I would say uh, 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 adventurous addition to, uh, to the villa. But, the real issue here is that it was either never used or barely used at all because probably soon after that is we start to get the first of our earthquakes. Once again, we see our, our earthquake mosaic. And there's several things that we know uh, have gone on here. Now, Evo pointed this out, and I, 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 this is another thing I disagree with him on, uh, and it's only because we haven't had, uh, now that he's out of New Hampshire, we haven't had as much time to talk over these things. But the, the, uh, for example, one of the things we know that happens in this villa is that I think water gets shut off. Uh, and I think that that water being shut off is the reason that these fountains are abandoned. Uh, and, and, and that things are, they, they're not only abandoned, they're buried. So the whole, the whole sort of scheme of, of this changes uh, and, and running water more or less ceases to exist. Now here's the issue. We don't know if this came from, the, this could have come from the earthquake of 62 or it could have come from some of the later earthquakes that happened. 
The issue is, is that there's a lot of damage going on here. And it seems like there may have been some attempts, maybe some, some idea that, okay, we'll get it going again, we're gonna restore it, we're gonna fix it, but it just never happened. And we know that because as uh, John pointed out, our, our black columns uh, from Peristyle 60 are moved all the way, some uh, all the way across, halfway across the villa, uh, and where they were found in room 21, maybe to be sold off. Um, and again, even John pointed this out: the uh, the Opus Sectile in room 78 had been taken out, but not taken out with just sort of with like you know reckless abandon, but with such precision that it preserved the. The, the entire uh, decorative scheme. And we see the same things in the, uh, in the, the uh, excavations that Evo pointed out at the south of the pool. Again, a beautiful opus sectile floor that is, you can see where it's been partially removed. So it's not as if things are just damaged, things are being taken apart. Um, and even the things that are being added, and I might argue that this floor that Evo discusses is a later addition, and the reason that it's this sort of raw concrete is that uh, whatever use it, it has is very utilitarian. And we even see windows. Here's a window sill with a beautiful marble uh, sill on it where it was walled in. You can see the remnants of this kind of crude walled in space. So what we have in Villa A, to, to summarize for Villa A before we move to Villa B, is we have an ambitious building program of a very sophisticated architectural space that's made for grand scale entertainment that is essentially abandoned. So in those 40 years, we have the hopes of this great, this great space and this, this really opulent addition. And then the whole thing falls apart and within within probably 20, maybe even less, maybe 10 or 15 years of its initial construction, it's abandoned. So while that's going on, we have something completely different going on down the street uh, at Villa B. And we've seen uh, Giovanni's reconstructions of the coastline. Uh, Villa, Villa uh, A is the, uh, is the Blue Cross and and uh, Aplantis B is the yellow one. So important again is the fact that they're, that they're right on the ocean. Uh, I won't get to too much of the history. Evos covered that, uh, but the, the building does date back. I mean, we could have looked at these columns before we ever excavated and knew this, this building date uh, dated back to the second century BCE because that's when this type of tufa is used. Um, uh, and this, uh, and, and the oldest part of the villa is this central core uh, that makes up this uh, two-story peristyle. Uh, and I'll skip across here. So let's look quickly at the, at the makeup. Evo touched on this in, in, in his talk, but I, I wanna, I'm gonna get in a little more detail. So essentially we have the, we have the, the, the central core, which is that middle, that middle peristyle with these yellow rooms that I have highlighted here, opening up to them. They are, everything is, is changed over the years, but this is more or less what we know is original. So that's one part of the villa. Um, and then we have the entrance on the east uh, where the blue arrow is. On the south side uh, that Evo talked about, we have these, these, uh, we have these um, big storage uh, uh, rooms with barrel vaulted rooms uh, that face out probably to the sea. On a, on, they face out on a big portico and on out to the sea. Here's a shot uh, of that portico. And then upstairs we have what, are, what seem to be, I'm actually become very interested in the upstairs. On one side we have an apartment. Up, it almost, there's the chance that maybe upstairs uh, of, uh, of, of, of the courtyard area could have been some sort of offices or, or even uh, accommodations for, uh, for people, for traders who are coming in the area. We're still looking into that. But very simple painted schemes, nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. I just, I, I show you one here. Um, another building out to the west, which is some sort of warehouse faced in brick. And then Evo's uh, townhouses uh, on, that face a street on the north side. Uh, and what's important is that these houses probably, these were probably used to house a lot of the people who are involved in what's going on uh, in, 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 the, in the entire complex. Uh, here's a, uh, another shot of the streets 
one of these small uh, houses. Again, I'm going through these quickly because you saw these. And then our strong box, and we've talked about the strong box, but what does the strong box tell us? Tell, what does it tell us? It tells us that, for sure, as John said, there was, there, was, there was money here. So whereas things are abandoned up the street in Villa A, we've got commerce here, we've got money, we have to protect, we have to protect our finances. So they have this, this spectacular box. Um, and, and we have the people, the people that were found in room 10, we've seen the skeletons. Uh, we had people with jewelry, uh, we had slaves, uh, we had 54 skeletons uh, discovered, so a lot in one place. So again, a cow on, in the luxury villa and 54 people uh, down uh, in, in Aplantis B. And then we have our, 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 our good man, Lucius Crassus Tertius, certainly one of the, uh, of the people, of the 54 people, uh, with his signet ring that has his name on one side, and then has Elaine kindly pointed out to me, because uh, I'd never seen the other side of it, uh, what is, a, appears to be like a, a small wine pitcher uh, or, or, or knockaway type uh, pouring uh, uh, on the other side, just to make sure uh, that we know he's all about uh, wine. And, and, and I'm going to jump now into what something that Evo already talked about. But I think what, when we start to look at the, the, the clues here, and these are clues that we've excavated and clues that we have since discovered, that we find out that the wine here and, and, or, and the activities that, that are here, this, this space has been, in, in these later phases that Evo talks about, this space has been constructed for very specific reasons. I take you back to OPV1, our first trench in 2012, and Evo pointed out these, these, these big boulders that they had to excavate through, uh, and he wasn't happy when I, I said, well, you've, we've got to make that, that scarp, we've got to make that scarp look nice to photograph it, and so that's why there's a lot of, there's cursing of Michael along that edge where you see those boulders sticking out, and, and it looks nice. But, uh, but it took a nice photo, and I'm getting to show you now, and that's why we did it. So uh, when we see this, it's like, well, what does, what do those, what does that look like? Well, if anyone's ever seen, and I, I, I failed to bring you a, a slide, I apologize, but a Roman road, they're huge basalt blocks that are sort of stuck together. And these are not quite that uh, beefy, but they're still... Uh, this is still a serious pavement, and it's, so we know right away that the interior is made for traffic. And when we look back toward, uh, now we're looking back toward the east where I said the entrance came in, you even see that the intercolumniation is specifically split open there, and then we have uh, these two guard stones at the bottom. So there's, this is made for cart traffic to come uh, in and out of. Uh, and we even see one place on, on one of the columns, if it's in the right place, may have even maybe even suggest where, where, where certain uh, vehicles had sort of rubbed up against it. We have, we excavated where these blue arrows here uh, going, we're now looking the other way where you're going in. These are ruts uh, from the carts uh, that went into the courtyard. Uh, and so here they are coming in the entrance. And when they would get, these carts would get into the entrance, we believe they would turn around and probably back themselves up onto the, in, the spaces between the intercolumniations here, and you even see the cart ruts in those uh, intercolumniations. So, so this is where, this is, I mean, the, the evidence here is telling us about what the activity is. And we all know now that it's no, it's no, uh, it's no, uh, uh, it's no mystery now that, that at least, at least at the time of the eruption, they were concerned about wine. We've talked about the amphora. Here's the famous stack of them. It's found uh, on this side of the uh, this side of the courtyard here, where that, that pink is on the north. There's a stove we believe was probably uh, used to heat pitch, uh, and then there was the pitch pot, which is in I like the pitch pot, which was in that's in uh, the show here, which was probably held the pitch that they would, uh, I mean, specifically used to uh, put on these amphora. And it wasn't just that one pile of amphora that were left drying, but when we looked, when we found uh, uh, some of the uh, archival photos, we realized that those amphora were all over the place. Uh, and they were probably pretty much ringing the entire, uh, the entire uh, sort of uh, uh, 
overhanged area there, loggia area of, of, of the courtyard. And as Evo mentioned, the, the majority of these are Dressel 2-4 amphora, which are, are, are specific to the wine trade. They're easy to see and figure out because they have those kind of dual roped handles on them. And as Evo pointed out, we have no shortage uh, of these. Uh, uh, and actually, the number I think now is closer to 1,500 after this uh, year than 1,400 because we've documented, we've documented uh, yes, we've documented about 1,200 here, but there are another uh, 1,300 here, but there are another 200 roughly in Villa B and that are stored in Villa A that were actually uh, part of this. And these bring us some great details. I show you here the neck of one of these amphora that still has the ancient cork uh, stuck in it. So that is a piece of ancient cork. So, uh, and as someone said to me, what kind of corkscrew did one use to extract a cork of that size? And I have yet to find one. So I think this is why they, they would just drill holes uh, in, the, uh, in the amphora. So the, the last, the remaining time I have here, I wanna talk about what is going on specifically. Um, we know, and we're going back here, if this is in, in, indeed uh, Mount Vesuvius, that there was, a, there, was, there was a great wine, that we know that wine was, was, was an important part here, and especially in the years, in these sort of years, uh, in the first part, in the first century uh, AD. And we know that wine was, uh, we hear about Pompeian wine from ancient authors. We, know, we find uh, Pompeian uh, amphora stamps uh, uh, all over the Mediterranean. So we know that wine is moving out of uh, Pompeii. And here is, of course, our image of Mount, if this is Mount Vesuvius, with the wine, with the wine, uh, with the vineyard on it. And, and, and then another little thing to talk about here is this other great site. And I, I like to talk about it in conjunction. I don't know if they were related, but it, it's a nice way to sort of put a narrative to what's going on here, which is that just, south, just up the road, about two kilometers away from Aplantis, uh, was a site, uh, the Villa Rustica at Boscoriale, that was actually excavated at more or less the same time as Aplantis B by the same guy who was excavated, or overseeing all of these excavations. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Stefano Di Caro. Uh, so, it, it too was important. Now, what is, what is this? And it's also, it's also nice to bring it up here because it's called the Villa Regina. Uh, so, it makes sense. Um, here's a plan of it. It was a wine producing facility. It had vineyards around it. Uh, it had uh, a wine press. It had uh, areas for aging the wine. Here is uh, here's, uh, here's the remnants of that wine press. Here are the dolia, the big vats, the big terracotta vats that are sunk into the ground. And these were sealed at the time of the eruption. And this is one of the reasons, and I'm not going to get into it, that people believe now, one of the, part of the evidence that people believe that the eruption of Vesuvius didn't happen in August, but happened in the fall, probably as late as November, because the harvest, the, the harvest was in pressed, fermented pressed, and now in uh, already being uh, stored. So, so let's look at this whole process. So people were picking the grapes, obviously. Uh, they would press, uh, they would uh, press, ferment and press the wine. They would store them in these dolia. And then when it got time to, probably for the next harvest, and they had to make space, they had to cart them off. So where did they cart them? Well, we think they carted them off to Villa B, or a Plantis B, probably using a thing called a culeus. And you can see there's an image of a culeus on a cart. Uh, and it looks, if it looks like a, a headless cow, well, that's in fact what it is. It's an entire cow that is, or ox, that is tanned and sewn up and then filled with wine. But, and it would hold uh, somewhere uh, around probably, uh, give or take, the estimate is about 500 liters. Uh, so si about 20 amphora worth uh, of, of wine. Uh, so it would go to Villa B, it would come, uh, it would come down the road that Giovanni de Maio thought that, thinks that he's found on the east side of the villa, and we like that idea. Uh, it would come in to our courtyard, they would pull up to the uh, 
how I found a drawing of two guys emptying a Coleus into an amphora, I, will, I don't know, uh, but I did. Uh, and it, they would pull up to the, to the intercolumniation, they would empty the wine into uh, the amphora, then once they were collected and, and they would take them out, go back down Giovanni's Road, load them on to ships, and send them off to far reaches of the Mediterranean. So what we're probably looking at, and we know there was wine, we've already documented the wine inside some of these amphora, is we're probably looking at wine from the vintage of 78, which had been prepared, ready to ship out, and then, and because as they made the vintage for 79, they had to make room. So, so we've probably got the 78 vintage of Pompeian wine, maybe even some from, uh, from Villa Regina. Uh, 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 heading, heading back out. Now what's interesting is you would think that we even have a wine press uh, going back to uh, Villa A. Uh, and that where that, this, this yellow arrow is, is actually a room that had a wine press in it. It's only partially activated. It's not much, it's very hard to study because it's dark and full of mosquitoes, but it's also very narrow. Uh, and so the question is, and, and my study of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the masonry here suggests that this is a late addition. So part of me wonders is, is this wine press maybe still being used in some capacity after the abandonment of Villa A? It's a hy hypothesis, it's a question, not even a hypothesis, but it's something uh, worth considering. But no, even though our villa is abandoned, we didn't expect those ships to come in uh, empty-handed. They came in bearing uh, wine from other parts of the Mediterranean, uh, including wine here from Crete and possibly Spain. And so these were perhaps wines being brought in to sell to the rich and famous uh, who were uh, vacationing. I kind of I like to think of the I like to think of the Bay of Naples as the Hamptons of ancient Rome, not the bit, because it's, it's, the vague, it's the summer spot where everyone goes, and I'm sure Rome, like New York, is completely empty uh, uh, in, in the summer. Uh, so all of this wine coming in, going out, being bottled, there's money being made, there's people working, there are houses being renovated, there is so much going on at this little place. And, and, and when we start to look at the wine by the numbers here, uh, Let's say right now we're at about, we're estimating about 1,500 Dressel 2.4s with approximate capacity of 25 liters each. That's, 3, that's 37,500 liters of wine, the equivalent of about 50,000 bottles of, uh, of our 750 milliliter wine bottles, or a, just over about 4166, but just over 4,100 cases of wine. So it's, it's, it's not an insignificant amount of product that is gathered here waiting uh, uh, to leave. Well, I'm going to say the capacity of which is it's worth, because those empty amphora are waiting for wine to come in. So to wrap up here, when we look at Villa A and Villa B, uh, obviously these are amazing documents from the life and the leisure of, of the most elite uh, in ancient Rome uh, to, uh, to the more mundane trade-oriented uh, working uh, and, and commerce uh, side of, of the Bay of Naples. So they're two discrete and very different, um, uh, very different sites. And they seem to have been lived very, seen sort of very different endings. One was essentially abandoned uh, with a great vision for a, a grand party house that didn't really, uh, that didn't really make it, uh, while the other was uh, thriving uh, with full of people who uh, who met an unfortunate end, uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>